All right. So basically today, it's all up to you guys to ask some questions. Uh, you might be able to wander with some topics for a bit if no one has any questions to ask. But hopefully you do. Does anyone have any questions? Maybe from past quizzes, things you're not comfortable with currently. Yes. Sure. So, uh, the main example actually might be right here. So, main deal behind buffer overflow tax are we have some buffer here, char C, which is only of size 12, uh, but then we are inserting something into that buffer, but not checking exactly how much we are inserting. Uh, so here we're inserting sterling of bar into uh, C, but who knows how long bar is. So if it's longer than 12 characters, then this is going to overflow this buffer. So looking at this picture, uh, if you take 61, you'll get much more familiar with this sort of lay layout and actually dealing with the saved frame pointer and return address and parent routine stack and all these actual things. Uh, but here you just need to know that we have the, this little space for our buffer. So here we have C0, and then we have like C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. But under normal circumstances, we would fill this buffer as per usual. We would put, like if we inserted hello, we'd have like H-E-L-L-O backslash zero, and then just a bunch of empty space. Uh, but for a hacker, oh, I guess this is the example. For a hacker, we get something like this, where what they're specifically trying to do is usually override the return address. So whenever you call a function, a new stack frame gets pushed onto the stack. That stack frame needs to know how, or well, the function that has been called needs to, needs to know how to return to the function that called it. So if main calls foo, foo needs to return to main. And so that's what this return address does. Uh, but what the hacker's going to do is override it with a special return address, where, again, little endian. So, uh, it's not straightforward, but each byte is backwards. So the, this return address, uh, as far as the computer is concerned, returning to this address is equivalent to returning to foo or main or whatever function called it. So it's going to return to this address, which just so happens to be this address, which either sometimes uh, what they do here is use the return address of like a specific function that they know is already there. So uh, I can't remember what the function is called. I'll look it up later. Uh, but here, what they're doing is call or is passing the return address to the stack itself. And uh, this is somewhat strange where there are examples of memory where like memory can be split up into like read only, read write, and executable memory where we have seen read-only memory before, where like the, uh, if I say char star s equals hello, I can't modify hello. That's read-only memory. So uh, there's also this idea of executable memory, where the executable memory would be the text segment of your code. So looking at your usual address space layout. So let's, hopefully that's going to get me a good picture. So this works, where we have our stack up here, we have data memory, this is all, uh, ignore this basically, this is our heap, and then we have down here our main program code. So this uh, is similar to the place where we put our strings like char star s equals hello, and that it's read only. But you could also mark this main program code as executable, and if you are doing that or your operating system does that correctly, then this should be the only place in memory that code can actually execute. Which means that this sort of buffer overflow attack we have over here would be ineffective. Because this is trying to execute memory up here in our stack. So notice the picture is reversed. We have our stack kind of growing up. Here the stack is growing down. For CS50 purposes, the stack grows up. So, uh, 
it is possible to circumvent this particular type of buffer overflow by having these executable regions of memory and non-executable regions, but it just so happens that rarely is executable memory marked as executable. It just tends to be read-only and rewrite are the only things that are used. So this is still very effective. And here we could put whatever we want here. So it wasn't actually done as a PSET in 61 this year, but if you look at like last year's offering of it or any previous year, uh, one PSET is you are specifically supposed to insert in here code that is supposed to like print some specific value or return a value that is different from the value that is supposed to be printed. Or even more cleverly, uh, you, it wants you to call or write, or so this will return up to here, and then you'll execute some code in here, and the cleverest of overflows will then return to what this return address used to be. So even though we needed to override this to come up here, we still we still remember that return address somewhere so that we can return to main or whatever. And it's like we never even noticed that things went wrong, but things did. So that's the sort of case where like maybe inside of here we jailbroke our iPhone. So things go as normal, like we run some program and things end up returning to whatever it's supposed to return to. But in the meantime, you manage to destroy the entire operating system. So. You don't need to know like code concerning buffer overflows or actually like taking advantage of it. You do need to know like the basic ideas of this is the buffer that's being overflowed and this is the reason that it can be overflowed because we're not checking whether we're actually within the bounds of it. The solution for preventing it is just checking the bounds. Yeah, so in this case, the solution would be like uh, you could either say if Sterlin of bar is greater than 12 minus 1, because you need the backslash 0 at the end, uh, or you could manually do like a for loop that only copies the first 11 characters, or just anything where you're actually checking to make sure you don't overflow that buffer. Other questions? Yes. Can you talk about tries? Or is there something else to say about implementation? Uh, sure. So, over. Which one? This one. Okay. So, the actual program, we would never make you do a implementation of a try on the exam because it would be unfair to those who did hash tables. And similarly, we would never make you implement a hash table on the exam because it'd be unfair to those who did tries. You should nevertheless know like the struct of a try or the struct of a hash table or whatever. Uh, that's actually true of any sort of data structure we've seen. So linked lists, stacks, queues, binary trees, you should be able to define those structs by heart. So try, that means the only thing you will need to do is like maybe we'll Give you, uh, give you some word or something, and we'll say like construct the try that, or we'll give you maybe a set of words, and we're like construct a try that represents this dictionary. So, the let's make our dictionary cat and dog. So, the idea of the try is we start out with this array, of twenty six slots. And in each slot, the actual index of the slot corresponds to the letter we're concerned with. So here, if we're trying to insert cat into our try, so the first character is C, which is going to be, if A is 0, then B is 1, C is 2. So we're going to go into the second index, and we're going to create a try off of that. We're just going to have 26 slots. And then we are going to index the second character of cat. So that's A, which is going to be the zeroth spot. Now it's going to have 26 spots. So then we go to T, and we would also have that come down. 
which is actually kind of important because let's have it come up here. Here's our try for t. Let's say this is index t is 19. So the important thing to remember about tries is you can't just keep track of like these pointers. You also have to keep track of whether this is actually the end of the word of a word. So inside of here, we need some kind of flag that says, OK, this is actually the end of a word. The reason being, if we let later try and insert catastrophic into our dictionary, which has the same starting three characters, but goes off further, uh, we need to recognize that this is the end of a word. Or alternatively, if we try to look up CA, which maybe isn't a word, but we get down to here, then we, or would it be C, and then we look at A. So we need to recognize that even though there is a pointer coming out of this node, it doesn't represent the end of the word. So what does that mean? Are you going to say? No. Oh, what does that mean our struct looks like? It's uh, array of pointers that is 26 long, and then a bool word or not word. Yeah, so we'll have struct try star uh, pointers. So here we'll say 26 on, and then the semicolon over here. But on the P set, we also needed to account for apostrophes, which meant you needed to like hard code that apostrophe was index 27 or something. But here, we only care about 26. Uh, and then we need maybe a char, in or bool. Uh, let's call it is word. So that's two of the three things you, I think you would ever need to know about tries building them, the struct of them. The last thing is the runtime of them. So what is the runtime of a try? Or well, look up in a try. Um, yeah, so this is where we say it's O of K, where K is the length of the word we happen to be looking up. But at the same time, we say, at least for PSET, or well, PSET 5, speller's sake, we say the longest word in the dictionary is 45 characters. So this is basically O of 45, which is constant time. So if there is an upper bound on your longest word, then, or even here, like the English dictionary, there is an upper bound on your longest word, or any dictionary. There is a longest bound on your upper word. Uh, so no matter what you do, it is constant time. But O of K is nice because like, hey, there actually is a difference between running, uh, say, a 45 character word versus an alphabet with only, which only has words up to three characters. Uh, another thing about that is that the The, oh, because like just saying that 45 happens to be our longest word is kind of silly. Because at the same time, like let's say an algorithm is O of n. Well, OK, because memory only supports up to 2 to the 32 bytes, then n is at most 4 billion. That's constant time. Which is why at some point it's silly to say this sort of thing where there's an upper bound that we can just reduce to constant time. because. Everything is constant time when you think of it that way. But here we'd probably accept both of these. In any case, explain either that O of 1 means you have an upper bounded uh, length of word, O of k means your length of the word, or well, k means length of the word. Yeah? Because the Boolean, because you, when you made your, uh, your try, it seemed like it was, you would go C-A-T, and then you go to the next oh, pointer, and then yeah. it would tell you if it was true. Would you put that true at like width, like the, the T, or would you have to point So let's think, 
this is the case where like a lot of examples you can just try and like come up with simple and or extreme examples and what it should be. So let's think of the word A. So in our original try, Would we want to put it a one here, or would we want to put a one down here? So I would say that in the end, it could probably be either or. I can't think of a reason. Well, really, you wouldn't. All right, so the reason I wouldn't put it down there is because you don't even need to go that far. We never need to allocate this try. We just put the one up there. So like the end of the word, that's, this is still pointing to null. But if we're only going to have single characters, there's no reason to extend down to another try just to mark that letter as used. So similarly, like if we had put the A down there, then necessarily all of these would just be zero at all times. But don't we need like sort of a starting try that will point to this A? So we have some global or something struct try star T, which points here, but that's just a pointer. It's not like a full blown try that's pointing to it. Okay. But that, do I have modulo enough? I can make it a But what if you, okay, so how would we assign uh, the letter so, I, the, the word I? So uh, his question might be answering that. Hold on. So that is an issue where a try in and of itself, I don't know the way the piece I would have written it. The previous struct was bad. But we could also do, let's say, like struct node is a bool. And a pointer. There's actually multiple ways you could write it. Alternatively, try it doesn't need to be a tr uh, struct and even try Twenty-six is a try. And this is no longer struct. So now there's going to be hmm, I'm trying to think of the way the piece I would have expected you to. Well I looked at I pulled up like the review session and I think they just go to the like if you have an A then you go to the next. That's how they do it. And then you, it, it goes a true there. And it goes away. Yeah. So that that does work. It wastes the space of, mm -hmm. like, you necessarily have a whole another level of try that you wouldn't need in the first place. Here it's getting ugly with each, basically what I'm trying to do here is associate, like, instead of being 26 pointers to do tries, it's 26 bool pointer, bool pointer, bool pointer, and so mm -hmm. on. And... Yeah. So you can't make like two arrays, like an array of booleans and an array of uh, pointers? So you could, but then you'd need to like, or two arrays of booleans and pointers. So you would need to then like build your array of booleans. Like your array of booleans needs to be as big as the try. Because you can't just have 26 booleans. It has to grow with each possible like your try has more than 26 true or false possible words. 
So at that point, you, they may as well just be a single struct that your try grows down with. Why is this doesn't seem right? Because that, mm, what do I want here? So try start T. Can you do? That might be the syntax I'm looking for. And this can just be a regular try. I'm not sure. But the that is the way that we did it in the review. Mm -hmm. So that works perfectly fine too. In which case, if it is just bool is word and then an array of 26, then you do have to go to the next level. I don't think about the way I would do that. Other questions? Can I ask questions about something else? Yes. Can you go over what the difference is in when you use jQuery versus Ajax? So they are, in and of themselves, completely different. jQuery does enable Ajax. Uh, it does give us some easier use of Ajax. But like Ajax comes shipped with JavaScript. JavaScript has Ajax capabilities. Uh, all Ajax means is like I'm I'm already on a page, and when I want to when I click on something, like I don't need to reload the page to download that new information. I just request that new information. So you can look at it in say like Facebook or something. So Network, shrink this. So down here, we see that we're getting all of these requests. Now when I click on like, or well, it's doing Ajax before I even click on anything. But if I click on like this, then it's going to make a bunch of requests down here, which just making these requests, oh, no one. <laughs> now it's over here. So let's refresh, do this again. We see that we get all these requests, but like this could still be in the process of the page loading. But notice Facebook is making these constant requests even after the page has loaded. And if I click on here, it'll make some more requests for some data that is in response to the thing I just clicked on. So uh, that's just what Ajax is, is it lets you pull for data that wasn't downloaded with the page originally. So jQuery is separate. jQuery is just like, it is a JavaScript library that makes a lot of things easier. And <coughs> it's, I'll leave that. So with jQuery, it's a lot of the advantage is this just, I mean, dollar sign. So dollar sign is a valid variable in JavaScript. So jQuery, all it's doing is saying like var dollar sign equals a whole bunch of stuff. So like some big function with all this stuff in it. Uh, and then you use that dollar sign in ways like dollar sign footer, pick, let's say dot Yeah, style, let's say like text line center. So jQuery gives us this sort of syntax where a big advantage of it has other features, but like what we want you to focus on most is just being able to select elements like this. So in regular plain old JavaScript, you could do things like document.getElementById footer dot, I don't know what it is at that point, something about CSS or style or something. So, and th but then alternatively, let's say we wanted to select by class. 
So now we are styling everything with a class footer with this style. Or even if we wanted to style any paragraphs. So this selector, being able to select things in the DOM like this is incredibly convenient since in H or well in plain old JavaScript, you would have to do document.get elements by class name or whatever it is. Or if I wanted a tag, I'd need to say get elements by tag name. So I need to know the specific ways that I access all of these things. The functions are going to be different depending on whether I'm using a class or an ID or a tag or what, uh, whereas jQuery just does that for me. So is jQuery going to be used when you're doing initial styling of the page or in order to change the styling after to it's already loaded? To change it. After it's already loaded. Yeah. Uh, it's any initial styling. Well, even the generally you would use this sort of change. Uh, you wouldn't like change. This would work perfectly fine. But usually you wouldn't change the style like this. Instead, you'd like uh, give it a new class or something. Whereas the CSS has already been defined for that class in a certain way. So by giving this, uh, these items that I'm selecting a new class, I'm applying the styles that have already been downloaded. So you like select a couple of checkboxes and the things that you've selected change to a new style. Yeah. And start looking different. Yeah. So the other things to remember about, well, there are several functions you should remember about jQuery. Let's say that we are selecting something with IDP. So, <coughs> what? So this means ID. ID. So it's equivalent to CSS. So CSS selectors, it's inspired by that. Where in CSS, if I wanted to style a footer or something with ID footer, it'd be like text align. Center. You won't need to write CSS on the exam, but like, you need to know the selectors. You need to know what you need to know how to read it. Uh, but you would never. We never. You don't need to memorize like all of the different possible styling things or any of them. So jQuery. Things you should remember, you should remember like dot HTML and a common pattern in jQuery. Let's rewrite this. A common pattern is we have like dollar sign hash f dot HTML. So if I put just plain parentheses, that means get the HTML. Whereas if I say HTML and put whatever I want in here, some link to something. Putting something inside of the parentheses now sets the HTML. So that's pretty common amongst a bunch of functions. There's the same deal with text. So the difference between HTML and text is that text is going to insert this as literal, like less than a greater than instead of as a anchor tag. Uh, and text is going to be the same if I just do this. It's going to retrieve the text of the document, not the HTML of the document, but just the text within this or within this element. Another one is if f happens to be a, an ID for an input, then hash f dot val. So if I want to set the input to something, like let's say I hit a checkbox and then want to set a default value. So like dot val, uh, I don't even know, three. So that will automatically insert into the text box three. But if I say dot val, then that will retrieve whatever is currently in the text box for me. And this is useful for like form validation, where if say like, I just wanna make sure that they actually filled out all of the things. So one way of doing that is after I hit submit, it's inevitably sent to some page on the server. You sh like for us, it'd be PHP. And that would try and process the data. And it would say, oh, they didn't fill something out. So now that 
redirects them to another page that says, up, oh, you didn't fill everything out. But instead of having to do that, instead in JavaScript slash jQuery, you can check just see is val empty or is val empty quotes. So that's going to just, now we can alert them you didn't fill out this field. So inevitably, you do need to do the PHP server side checking because you can just disable JavaScript in all browsers. But JavaScript makes it convenient for those who do have it activated. And I mean, virtually 99 point something percent of browsers have it on nowadays. Very few people turn JavaScript off. So it is a user convenience. You need to do PHP uh, validation. You should do JavaScript validation. Yeah. What does pound f refer to here? What does pound f refer to? There is some element in my document with ID f. We'll look at probably Facebook has plenty of examples where if I come to elements, looking here under the elements tag, I see like this particular div that's being highlighted up here, or is it the whole page? Yeah, it's up there. So this has ID page bar. So in console, I'm assuming they're using jQuery. Yeah, so I could select pagelet, what was it, pagelet blue bar? Pagelet blue bar. Blue bar. So that selects that, and I did something wrong. Uh, let's try, I don't know what that would be now. Or maybe they aren't using jQuery, and that character is mapped to something else. And there you go. Okay, better example in something I know is using jQuery. So looking at our elements here, we have say, uh, here's class equals navbar. So this is something with class navbar. So inside of our console, we can look up the thing with class navbar. So here we can like scroll over this and see that's what this is. If I wanted to do dot text, this is the text of that. So I see like setting for port bug log out, which are all like under here, but that's still text within that HTML tag. I could set the HTML to just some link. Um, quotes. So I'll get rid of my bar. Now that got rid of the header entirely, just set it to link to YouTube. And then is there any form example? So here's a form. I can right click and inspect element to come to it right here. I see that its ID is text search. So down here, if I do ID text search, so hovering over it, I see that that is the correct thing I was searching for. I want to do dot val. It would give me what I had typed there. I wanted to do hello. It'll change it up here to hello jQuery. Of course, I could do ridiculous like document dot get element by ID text search. I don't even know what it is at this point. Dot value. No. Oh, I forgot that guy. So that's hello. I don't know how I'd set it equals something. Yeah, so that changed that. Uh, but you don't need to use these. And very many websites at this point use jQuery. So usually, even like on a final project, if you're doing a web project, the first thing I recommend is just including jQuery. So you can just get the convenience of all these functions. Yeah. I think I saw a different way to like get to a element using DOM. Do you have to like use dot and then keep going down? So you can do that. I don't know if it would work very well. It's difficult to navigate that way. Mm -hmm. So like one example is uh, I don't even know if we have any forms, but like document dot forms is going to return the list of forms that's on this page. Then I can do like document dot forms. Zero, it's going to be the first form, dot, I don't know what we've called that. So 
so it doesn't even have a name. So maybe inputs will work? No. I don't even know how to get at this. My get element it's i tag name input. Yeah, so that gave me the input. And now I could I want the zeroth input and I want to select its value. So that's gonna give me text. So I had to end up doing get element by tag name anyway. There might be some way to select it directly through form zero. Uh, but the nice thing about this is still like I only had to get the tags called input that were a child of this form. Otherwise, if I just did that straight up front, this would select all elements on the entire page in the entire document instead of just that form. Probably won't even be the one I want. Uh, I don't even know which one it is. I don't know. I guess the first, the first input element on our page is this little checkbox. The answer key it says that PHP. Um, the, I don't know whether it's the answer key or notes, but in, it says PHP um, is ser the server side and JavaScript is client side. What exactly is the difference between those two? So difference okay. between JavaScript server client side, PHP server side. So uh, if you have heard of slash used Node.js before, you would think that JavaScript isn't just client side. But for CS50 purposes, it is, or at least for this quiz's purposes, it is. Uh, PHP being server side. So like, no JavaScript. When you write your web page, you will be writing PHP on the server. You will never be writing JavaScript on the server. JavaScript ends up getting sent to the browser where the JavaScript code executes. And in the JavaScript code needs to live in the browser because otherwise when I want to like just do any sort of JavaScripty thing, like clicking on this, I'm not reloading a page. This is just JavaScript reformatting things for me. So if JavaScript lived on the server, then I would need to inevitably request something of the server to know how, what to do. PHP, there is no such thing as PHP in the browser. It's when I request a page, uh, so let's say here I requested this particular page. So that means that this is going to request refresh. It's going to refresh this page. So this request goes out to my server. Uh, it sees that it needs to return this particular thread with this particular ID. So now the that's going to be some PHP that uh, the PHP interpreter is going to interpret that page and transform it into just HTML, CSS, maybe JavaScript, whatever. So this it's PHP that processes this request and retrieves all of like the text and stuff that I'm actually looking for from the database. But what leaves the server is just HTML slash JS slash CSS. Uh, there is no PHP which leaves a server because if it actually did, then the browser would have no idea what to do with it because that doesn't know what PHP is. But in the same thought, uh, because JavaScript is client side, you can never access MySQL from it. Because PHP is server side, you do access MySQL from it. Yeah. Can you go over some of the security concerns with cookies and HTTP? Uh, so those are not things we're going to need to know. Oh, okay. uh, the some of the security concerns with cookies and HTTP. So the big question here is we see here that my cookie is PHP sesh ID. So that's like the universal PHP, your session. So your session is something that inside of PHP will never need to be validated because it's the server that has complete control over the session. You can't touch it at all, but it's this cookie, this one, and I guess you could log in as me right now if you wanted to use that, but it's that cookie uh, that 
uh, the like inevitably you make a single request to the server. The server returns the page. The request is done. It no longer has any idea who you are. So the next request you make is going to include that cookie so that it knows, oh, this is the person who made this request before. This is the session data that is associated with this user. So that's why you don't have to log in for each and every page you use. Uh, the security issue here is that that cookie is sent out just over the web. There's no, uh, we're using HTTPS here. So in this case, that means that we are encrypting this stuff. So someone can't come in and just steal my cookie and now, now the server will think they're me. But with straight HTTP, they can. Just like this Wireshark, Fire Sheep stuff that you can just listen to all of the Wi-Fi's in the air and intercept whatever you want. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, a sort of similar security risk is like storing user IDs in post, because that can be freely edited using consoles and things. Yes. So. Uh, there's plenty of issues where like just anything that comes from the user you need to validate like if you there are plenty of cases where it would be useful for like I'm about to make a post blah 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 then I hit reply so it would be very useful if the post request included my ID because like I want to associate this post with me but I can't do that because I am free to make a post request. I just like manually come up with my own post request that uses your user ID and now it will post as you. So that's why server side, I can't rely on uh, post requests containing the correct user ID. That's why it has to belong in like session. So I look up your user ID in my session array and I insert that into my database as the user who actually made this post. And that's based on your cookie? Yeah, so it uses the cookie to match up you as the user who made that request. It pulls out the user ID from that session and that's been inserts into the database using that user ID. So this like button, what that's actually doing is, I'm not gonna find it here, it's gonna be Ajax function. What is Ajax function? It was a CS50 project a while ago. I can't remember what it is. Oh, but so Ajax function, all Ajax function is doing uh, is making an a Ajax request to a page with this ID, with the ID 22453. It's not even a post request, it's a get request, which makes it even easier so that if I knew what the URL is, it's something like, uh, like this slash ID equals 22453, or question mark ID equals 22453. So visiting this URL will like that, which wouldn't be as much of a problem, but it's incredibly easy to write a loop, which is just going to visit this URL over and over again, which is why you see I saw you Harvard post with thousands of things. And they tend to be CS50 based I saw you Harvard posts how do I find the most liked? They tend to get deleted pretty quickly too. This is not the most liked. There we go. So, cheaters on the most liked page, that's pretty relevant to this right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh wow, they've already deleted uh, any of the ones from this year which have been cheated on. Uh, those have all been deleted. But yeah, there will never be a post that gets this high. This one was obviously cheated on to get onto the most liked page. <laughs> More questions? Um, what should we know about um, XHTML? Virtually nothing, just like what it is. Uh, the difference between it and HTML being that like, so, XML is very similar in appearance to HTML, except 
So in HTML, we just happen to have a predefined set of tags. But with XML, XML is just like a general format where you can make a, an XML document for whatever purposes you want. So for example, if I wanted, I could construct like a, an XML for the courses, and I actually think that CS50 has an API for this. So my XML document could look something like courses, and of course I need some end courses. I could have a course, and it could have, say, like, name equals CS50, and then my end course, and I could put inside of here, like, students, and then inside of students, I have, like, a list of one student whose name is whatever, and I end that student, and so on. So I just happen to have constructed some arbitrary XML document, but it is valid XML. So XML, all it is is this sort of structure. And the nice thing, the reason like that we even call it XML is that this sort of thing is very easy to parse. So like it's very easy to take this document and make an array out of it. And so XHTML is an attempt to get HTML to be valid XML. So already this looks pretty similar to HTML. Uh, some of the differences are like HTML, you are able to do things like input, uh, maybe type equals text, which is the default, so I don't need to say that. Disabled. So there are two things in here that made, make this invalid XHTML. The first thing is that all XML tags need a closing tag. So in the case of input, I need to do the, which direction of slash is it? This direction, that looks wrong. Other direction. So self-closing tag. The second thing is that with XML, you need these sorts of like key value pairs. It needs a value associated with it. So even though disabled in and of itself expresses what I want, this input should be disabled. That's invalid XHTML. What I actually need to write is like disabled equals disabled. So now it's valid XHTML. And these are just these slight differences that transform it from HTML to an XML based sort of thing. Yeah. XML is about like altering your own text altogether. Like why is it XML as opposed to CSV files or? So the, th uh, the think of like a CSV. So a CSV, you have just values separated by, I mean, just think of a spreadsheet. So a CSV is basically a spreadsheet. You have maybe columns and you have a bunch of rows that associate data with those columns, but that's it. XML is much more versatile in that like you can, uh, you have an arbitrary hierarchy of data and I could have multiple courses that have multiple students within it. Whereas it'd be difficult to think of a spreadsheet that like just that single spreadsheet, CSV especially like is just a single spreadsheet. So that single spreadsheet having uh, all CS50, 51, 61, and then within those, all of the students related to those times, maybe meeting times and all that sort of thing. The other thing is that the tag names give a nice like name to all of the elements. So reading a CSV file, it can be difficult to try and parse what it's actually seeing. XML is much more human readable. So that's why like come up to some person who doesn't really know what a CSV file is or like isn't a programmer or something. You can give them like a template XML file and they can follow the lines and like, oh, I'm supposed to insert my name here. So it's a much more usable format. CSV has plenty of uses, but XML has different uses. More questions? Other questions? Uh, um, you would not need to know that. I don't okay. think we even discussed that. Okay. 
I'm guessing it was just a one-off comment in oh, horizontal versus vertical scaling is not something you'll need to know. Uh, the, I think the difference is just like, oh, well, the answer key will say the difference. That vertical scaling is just like, oh, my computer's doing poorly, I'll get a better one. Whereas horizontal scaling is, oh, my computer is doing poorly, let me get 20 of them to all work on the same task. Can we go over like the linked list way of making queues? Sure. So that's easier than the array way. The linked list way of making queues. So first, what does our struct for linked list look like? I'll type that it. Are we doing it for? Let's like, do ints. Uh, ints. Yeah. The value and pointer are next. Yeah. So int val, and then struct, node star, next. So that's what we'll use for the uh, example here. Let's actually type up this stuff. Struct Okay. So now uh, looking at our queue we have the let's just make a global queue. Uh it'll be node star queue. And we have a dq function. I guess these things could also return true or false, or let's do that. So bool uh, dq, and we're dqing, oh, hmm. Int dq, what did we do with this before? Int dq, and we have uh, bool nq. We need to NQ some mixture. Let's do NQ first. So we have our queue. We want to insert something into the queue. What is the best way to do that? So over here, our queue currently looks like we have some global pointer to the start. There's our queue. Now, assuming that we DQ by taking the first element, where are we going to want to insert our node so that queues work as they should? Fair. Yeah. So queues are supposed to be last or first in, first out, which means that the new element should be inserted over here. Okay. So coming back to code. That means that we will want to loop over our queue. So let's do node star current equals queue. So while current does not equal null, what is, uh, I would do, all right, let's do it separately. So first current equals queue. So what do we do if current starts off as null? Do this two ways first this way. What do we do if current is null? So this is equivalent to if q is null. Return false. So should we return false? What's oh. wrong with inserting something into an empty list? Uh, nothing is wrong with that. Yeah, so here the only difference is my global q is being sent to my new node. then I have to do my checks of if q is null, return false, 
So that's what I do. Oh, and then Q val equals I, Q next equals null, return true. Okay, so I'm gonna jump the gun right here and remember what we did that last time where we said it was much easier to work with node star stars with this sort of thing. So now current going to be and Q and coming down to here, while current, while star current does not equal null. So let me just do current, we'll talk about this in a second, current next. Okay, so looking at it this way, this is iterating over all of my pointers until I reach a null pointer. The null pointer is gonna be the pointer I want to replace with my new node. So looking at iPad version, if my original pointer is null, the linked list is empty, then current is gonna point here. This is gonna to point to null. So this is the pointer I end up moving to point to some other new node. Whereas if the example is this case up here, then current is gonna traverse from here. I messed up slightly where current is supposed to be the address of current next. Is that what I want? Current, so star current gives me a node. Next traverses to the next one over here. So I'm currently pointing here do red. So I'm currently pointing here. Then star current is going to reference this node. Star current next references this node, but that's not what I want. I want this pointer to that node. So that pointer to this node is ampersand star current next. So at this point in time, I've officially reached the node that I want to replace. So let's replace all of these cues current. And now we're done. So maybe typos, but the idea is that with insert in this sort of way, it is easier to work with the pointers that we want to change instead of needing to keep track of like, okay, it is my start node. Oh, it is, then I need to create the start node to be something specific. Else I want to iterate until the next thing I point to is null, and then I'll replace that, what, I, what the next thing is to my malloc node. So instead of needing to separate those cases, here I only need to deal with the case of what is the pointer that is null that I no longer want to be null. And that makes life easier, except these should all be star current now. Because. But it's still the size of the node. Yes. So I'm still mallocking a node. Uh, is it going to be the size of the node star? So the. Coming back to. Here, think of the case if this is our linked list, then, well, new linked list. So this guy points off to null. After that while loop, current points to here. Because this is the pointer that is null. So now I want to change this pointer to point to a new node. So first, I malloc that new node. So malloc size of node. And that returns a node star. And now changing this pointer 
is equivalent to star current equals this new node that I allocated. So if current is a node star star, then star current is going to be a node star. And if I'm malloking something of size of node, then this is returning a pointer to a node. So this is a node star. So both sides correctly have the same type. And so if what I just allocated was null, return false, else finish setting them to what I want them to be. Except these need parentheses because that's not how the order of things work. Without the parentheses, that was being interpreted as current arrow val dereference that. Instead, I want to dereference current, which brings me to a node. Then I want to get the value associated with that node. I thought arrows allowed you to bypass that and go straight to the value. Uh, they do. So that's if I have, let's take q as an example. I'm allowed to do q arrow val equals i because q is a node star. Okay. If I do, if there were some nice syntax of like uh, current longer arrow val or something, <laughs> which referenced, or did two dereferences, then this would work well. So the arrow is only for one dereference. Yeah. Uh, alternatively, I could write this as star star current dot val. Uh, just like I could also write q as star q dot val. So that's insert. Or well, that's in q, I guess. dq is going to be significantly shorter. So let's put void in here for cleanliness. So dq. What element am I dqing? First one. Yeah. So if my first one is null, return, I don't know what we want to return int max. And then you should do a check to see if int max was returned. That's the sort of thing that like get int does. Uh, else we want to, so can we just return q val? Is that what we want to do? So dq also implicitly removes the item from the queue. So let's first say, let's get a temp to point to the first node of our queue. Now we want to advance our queue to point to the next thing in the queue. Now we have temp left. Temp val is the thing we want to return. So val equals temp val. But before we return it, we should free temp and return val. So the order of operations here is important in that we need to grab a temp before we move q to the next element. We need to get the value before we free temp, and then we can return the val. Shows it the q to q list. Yes. That was creating a bad loop. Slash it wouldn't work after freeing it anyway. Q equals Q next. We want to advance the Q to the next element, not advance the next element to what the element currently is. Stacks would be significant, even, like, even easier in that uh, DQ is exactly the same because we're pulling off the front of the stack. NQ would be very similar where we just want to allocate a node and insert into the front of the stack. So we don't even need to loop over anything. We just insert directly at the front. Everyone good on that? OK. More questions? So the most recent lecture, you do not need to know any code. Uh, you should know the 
overarching ideas. So, well, Nate's half didn't have any code. So those slides are online and just like look at them and they have the major ideas. Uh, my half, uh, like knowing the overall idea of like, well, first you can't trust anything. Uh, the fact that like maybe the process of the compiler can be bad, but it doesn't even matter that like the source code looks fine because the compiler might be specifically altered to change the source code in the process of compiling. Uh, same time, just like, I think those are like the major ideas of it. Um, so did you mention that you don't need to know um, anything really about fire sheet? Or, or do you need to know that? Uh, so with Nate's half of things, anything that Nate touched on, like Fire Sheep, Wireshark, I don't even think he did Fire Sheep in detail. Mm -hmm. Or you also did something with that. Was it Fire Sheep last week? Did you touch on that? Uh, yeah, I think we Yeah. That. So you, we, like, we're not going to give you like Fire Sheep output mm -hmm. and say, like, interpret this. <laughs> It's just going to be, it would, it would be a question like, what is Fire Sheep? What is it used for? I think it only works on version 4 or Firefox or something. It might be broken by now. Yeah. seem to have disabled it manually, but maybe it doesn't work with the most recent Firefox. Nah. So I guess it doesn't work with the most recent Firefox. But the idea still stands of what it was meant to show. It, it was absurd how much of the world was not living in HTTPS at the time. Like even in the last two years or whatever, it's still there's a dramatic improvement in the number of websites which use HTTPS. You want to go over HTTP? Uh, the protocol of it, or like, Probably like some of the things we should know. All right. So, uh, I mean, basic things are everything you can see in your network tab. So, when I request a page, going back up to the top to the main things. You can see here the request that I make. So Chrome happens to format it all nicely for us, where the request URL was this, the request method was get, and the status code was 200 OK. If I hit view source, I see more directly that, and this is this either, we could show you either of these, but it isn't too difficult to interpret between them. So here is the direct request I made. So this means that I went to apps.cs50.net slash discuss slash thread slash inbox slash all slash one. And the protocol it used was HTTP slash 1.1, which is virtually, it's always going to be that. Over here, we used get. So this might also be post. And then coming down, all the way down to response headers, if we view that source is where we see the 200 OK. So know the possible different status codes of these. Like I think the re or well in the review we do say a couple of these. So like 403, 404, those kind of common ones. Um, the that's the major idea of it. Uh, the difference just between HTTP and HTTPS is this encryption. Uh, I think so. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, could you like talk very generally about how encryption works? Because we talked, for example, when compressing Kotlin file, you know how to decompress them because you actually send the mm -hmm. table, the hash table within the file. So, how does encryption work? How do you know how to decrypt information if you haven't actually sent the client the key to the 
and uh, actually you can actually grab that key from. Yes. How does the general process work? So the general process of encryption. Uh, that is an incredibly detailed question of like, or well, answer. Uh, there is a short. Uh, un well, Tommy and I made the short. Unfortunately, it is like 26 minutes. So it is not a short, it is a long. Uh, but uh, our short was on RSA, which is just one example of these. And the, well, this RSA is part of the overall HTTPS protocol. So the idea, RSA is an example of public key cryptography, which means you have two separate keys. You use one key to actually encrypt things and use another key to decrypt things. So this key that you use to encrypt things is the one that's public. So the website can send you this encryption key and they use that, or like they do send you that encryption key and when you wanna send something back to them, you use that encryption key to encrypt all of your data and send it to them. So they're the only ones with the private key. Uh, if they get, if that private key became known, then anyone would be able to decrypt your data. But that private key, which is mathematically related to the public key, but you cannot figure one out from the other, so that private key uh, can be used to decrypt the data. Since they're the only ones with the private key, they're the only ones who can read the data. And it's, so like, even though the public key is public, so, I use the same, when I go to google.com or whatever, they might have multiple, I don't know. But if I go to google.com, he goes to google.com, she goes to google.com, we all can use the same public key to encrypt our own information to be, or however we want, but none of us are going to be able to figure out, are going to be able to decrypt their information because the public key isn't able to decrypt. It can only encrypt. And it's, fun slash detailed math of just like like a bunch of modulo operators and exponentials and stuff that it just works out that the private key is the only thing that can decrypt the public keys encryption stuff. Yeah, RSA short for more details. Is that on the website? Yeah, I think it is at this point, or at least I think a YouTube link to it was posted, so. Let's see. Shorts. I think it would have been week two related. Yeah, RSA. And it is, we're not gonna play this, 24 minutes. So it's a long one. More questions? Sure, so briefly, the idea is just that like what is it? Uh, bit masks. So the idea is that like, let's just say we have some, we're using an integer. So int, int x, so start off at zero. So now this integer is 32 bits. So any single one of those bits can be used to represent a specific flag. So this is where if you look at like operating system codes, they use this all over the place where maybe up top somewhere they like hash define, say like, let's see some examples. So man, to open, yeah, so the open system call, we can see here that it ha one of its arguments is int flags, which it, what it expects as that argument are some of these flags. We see o append, o async, o clo exec, o create, and so on, o direct. So these sorts of flags are hash defined somewhere. And all of them are exactly one bit. So like ocreat might be hash defined as one left shift four. And so that's gonna be the, whenever I use ocreat, that's just going to be like, 
in binary, one zero zero zero, and thirty ish zeros before it. So only a single bit is set, and that bit represents this flag. And so, any other flag, no other flag is going to be left shifted by four. So, I am able to represent up to thirty two flags in a single integer by doing say like. x equals o create bitwise or o direct. So you're just picking any two of those flags. Now x is going to have two bits set, which rep which correspond to the two bit two bits of o create and o direct. The way that then so then we pass x into the open function. And open needs to see what flags were actually set. So that's where it's going to do things like if x bitwise and o create do something, or if x and o direct do something else. And then there may be some flag that we didn't have set if x and o, I don't know what the other flags were. So that particular condition is not going to be executed, or that block of code is not going to be executed. But these two are because those two flags were set. And notice that, like, so in C, any value that is not 0 is uh, true. So x and o create will be either 0 or o create. Because o create only has a single bit set. If that bit is set in x, then this is going to return o create, the, the binary where just that bit is set. If that bit in x is not set, then it's going to return 0, in which case we know the flag was not set. So that's how you use bit masks. I think uh, on a previous exam or maybe in class or something, like you can also use bit masks to like print out the binary of a variable. So I can use, say, or well, looping over like one left shift zero, and then print if x and that if x and one left shift zero, then print a zero or one or print a one else print a zero, and then I go over once more. If x and one left shift two, then that means that the second bit of the variable is set, so I print a one, else I print a zero. And I think we might actually want to do that in the reverse order, because usually you want like the left side to be the highest order bits and the right side to be the lowest order bits. So I'll probably loop like four int i equals 31, 31 uh, until i hit zero then do that sort of just that exact condition if x and one left shift i print one else zero. Thank you. I think we're out of time. Any more questions in the last couple out of time seconds? All right, good luck tomorrow. It's, this was the last section where next week's going to be optional. Uh, I'll like give back quizzes and we can go over them and maybe go over other things that you are interested in or final project things or future CS classes things. I don't know. But this is the last material filled section. Bye.